Welcome to my talk on building a second brain, capturing, organizing, and sharing knowledge using digital notes. My name is Tiago Forte, and I've come here from Mexico City, where I live, to share with you an exciting new trend, a new movement, that I think has the potential of radically transforming how we work. But first, imagine for a second, it's Monday morning. You wake up refreshed from a nice relaxing weekend. You have breakfast with your family, make some coffee. And as you head into the office, you're determined that this will be a good week. You're going to be focused this week. You're going to be self-disciplined. You're really going to do the best work that you're capable of doing. You arrive at the office, go into the workspace, you sit down at your desk, open your computer, and suddenly you're faced with this a morass of files and folders, some of ambiguous origin, spread chaotically across dozens of different locations and different apps. And you feel a little discouraged, but you make the best of it. After all, you don't have time to sit there organizing your computer, do you? You go through your day and you go through your week, but in the background, there's a friction. Every time you use a device, one of your mobile devices or your computer, there's a cost. Someone asks you for a document and it takes you 10 or 15 minutes looking through different archives, looking through different folders to find it. You go to save a document and you have this creeping suspicion that no matter how diligent you are in deciding what to title it and where to save it, when the time comes when you actually need it, it will somehow have mysteriously disappeared. Or you're in a meeting and someone references a source that you know is incorrect, but you can't find the correction during the meeting, so you have to follow up with them later, when it makes less of an impact. As these little frustrations and these little obstacles crop up as you use your technology during the week, they slowly start to chip away at that focus, chip away at that motivation, and you find yourself more tired, more stressed, and more frustrated from having to use computers and having to use these devices. Does that story sound familiar to anyone? Here's the basic challenge. There's more information than ever that we need to successfully do our jobs. It's like every binder on that shelf has become an app on our phone. So it's available to us all the time and it's constantly changing. But in the past, we, we had a librarian to actually make sense of and manage all that data. Now we have to do it ourselves. It's like we each have a part-time job as a reference librarian, but we're not paid to be librarians. We're paid to do our jobs. And so the information accumulates. It accumulates in the background like a slowly gathering storm. And we never know when it's gonna break down, when we're gonna lose the files that we need, when we're gonna be overwhelmed with all of this stuff that we're accumulating. To put some numbers on this general feeling of dis-ease, the average employee in the United States consumes 174 newspapers worth of information every single day. That takes almost 12 hours per day consuming some form of media, and it's equivalent to 113,000 words every single day. And it's increasing 2.6% per year. So imagine, whatever your challenge is with information overload today, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse every single year. And the amazing thing is, despite all this time, basically all day long, interacting with information, we still can't find what we need when we need it. A report recently out from Microsoft says that the average employee spends, spends 74 hours every year searching for misplaced files, documents, and other items. 74 hours per year, just trying to find stuff that we know we have. I first started thinking about this problem, noticing this problem in 2013. I worked for an innovation consulting firm in San Francisco. And we would be paid by some of the largest companies in the world to research new trends. We'd spend weeks and weeks studying self-driving cars or drones 
or uh, self-tracking or smartwatches. And then we package up all this valuable knowledge that we had gathered into a presentation or into a report, hand it over. And more often than not, after a quick review, the client would just stick it in a drawer or stick it in a folder on a computer. And I noticed that despite all the investment that was made in terms of time and money and energy in creating this knowledge, it didn't seem like anyone was able to really get its full value, not the client and not even us. The knowledge that we were gaining was not persisting and being revisited and utilized over time. It was just kind of fading into the background of our memory. The past five years working on this problem in my own company, I've come to realize that this problem, the problem of knowledge management, is the fundamental problem facing businesses today. Every CEO that you talk to will, will proclaim that human capital is their biggest asset. Conservative estimates by economists indicate that the total value of human capital is five to ten times larger than the value of physical capital like buildings and roads and bridges. Five to ten times. By human capital, I mean the, the knowledge and know-how stored in human brains. This includes their experience, their wisdom. It includes their training and their education. It includes the shortcuts and the heuristics and the rules of thumb and the things to consider and the things to remember. All this tacit knowledge that humans accumulate every day just by doing their day-to-day -day work. Now, companies, what I found is that companies understand this problem. But what we've learned from decades of experience is that top-down knowledge management, creating knowledge capture programs and knowledge incentives, they just don't work. And I think the reason they don't work, they don't work is that knowledge is inherently personal. It's not a commodity that can be extracted or standardized or mass produced. As soon as you try to separate knowledge from the person that knows it, it loses its context. It loses the context of where it came from, why it matters, when it applies, what it might actually mean. So for these five years, I've really focused on a new form of knowledge management, a new take on it, which is called personal knowledge management. Personal knowledge management is about keeping the individual at the center of their own knowledge, putting them in the driver's seat. Instead of trying to take their knowledge away from them, actually giving them tools and new ways of thinking and new methods to make most effective use of what they already know. And think about it. How much time every year do you spend reading? How much time reading books and blog posts and articles and reports and emails? How much time do you spend listening? Listening in meetings, listening to podcasts and audiobooks, listening to seminars. How much time do you spend watching, watching videos, watching movies, watching courses, watching webinars? Where does all that knowledge go? Where is it? We spend all this time learning and so little time actually saving and cultivating and preserving the things that we've learned. Instead, we become infowars. We start force-feeding ourselves as much information as we can get our hands on, hoping that one more article, one more podcast, one more evaluation will give us that one fact or that one insight that will make the difference. Meanwhile, everything that we already know is slowly fading, getting hazier and hazier in the distance. Personal knowledge management isn't just about creating more value for companies. It's about creating more value for people giving them access to the value that they've already created through everything that they know and everything that they've learned. Now here's the secret. When you bring knowledge down to the level of the individual, make it small scale and local, it's no longer a technology problem. It's not a problem that's going to benefit from big data algorithms or from artificial intelligence. It's not something you want to scale or you want to automate. At the level of personal knowledge management, it's fundamentally a human problem. It's the mindset of the, of the actual person who has the knowledge. It's their mental models. It's the tools they have. It's the methods and the techniques. 
This is fundamentally a matter of training people, of training people to relate, to have a different relationship with their knowledge than they've had in the past. I want to share, share with you some of the most powerful takeaways and practical methods that you can use in your own work. These methods come from an intensive online course that I teach called Building a Second Brain. In this and two other related courses, I've taught more than 20,000 people how to go through this process, how to actually capture and organize and then start sharing their personal knowledge. There's three essential ways that you get value from a second brain. They're remember, connect, and create. The first one is to simply save ideas and insights in your digital notes on your computer. In a minute, I'll, I'll show you what that looks like exactly. But one, the first and most kind of basic stage of personal knowledge management is just remembering, offloading the detailed uh, memory of specifics from your biological brain which is not really well suited to that, to computers, which do that very well. The second value that you, create, that you get from a second brain is connecting things. Instead of just consuming, consuming knowledge, you start making connections, noticing patterns and associations. And this is just organizing your knowledge to reveal those patterns and relationships. And third is you, start, you can create things. You can share content that you've created to provide value for others. So let me tell you a little bit more about each of these and share three ways of doing each of them. When I say building a second brain, you might think of something like this, some futuristic sci-fi fantasy that is fascinating, but has nothing to do with your day-to-day -day reality. But this is really not what I mean when I say building a second brain. What I mean is something more like this. How many of you have some kind of notebook or notepad where you jot down notes of any kind. It's a technology that's been around for maybe centuries, right? You have a small booklet, you jot down ideas, things that occur to you, quotes that people said, things to do, things to remember, reminders, all these little things that kind of pop up in your brain throughout the day. Now, for this first way of using a second brain, remember, Imagine if you got that note notebook or that notepad just as you currently use it and you made it digital. You made it digital where it was backed up to the cloud so you, you couldn't lose it. It was synchronized to your different devices. So if you created a note on your desktop computer, it would be available within minutes on your smartphone. It was searchable. So you could search across hundreds or even thousands of notes in seconds. You could tag it, you could create links, you could share it. All the benefits that technology provides applied to your notes. And I know when I say your knowledge, that can seem a little bit abstract. What is my knowledge? Where is my knowledge? And really, I don't mean something super abstract. I mean, actually, the artifacts, I call them artifacts, that you already create and that you already use in your day-to-day -day work. Okay, these are th specific tangible things that represent what you know or remind you of what you know. So a few examples. You may have paper documents, reports, evaluations, memos, letters, mail, that, ha that contain ideas or insights or facts or statistics that you may want to you may want to keep. Imagine if you could scan those and the technology has gotten very good for this and keep them in a centralized digital form that you can always find them when you need them. You might have voice memos, voice memos that you've recorded on your phone or on a, a recorder. Those could contain ideas that you might want to revisit at some future point. If you read books, either paper books or eBooks, you might have notes, those highlights. You may have uh, little comments that you've added. You may have bookmarks. That is a form of knowledge. You could have text documents, Word documents, Google Docs. Maybe you use the Notes app on your phone. That's another source of knowledge that you can bring into your second brain. You could have handwritten notes. The technology has gotten so good that you can write something longhand, scan it into your computer, and it will be searchable. The computer can actually understand what you've written by hand. You might have other kinds of files, presentation files, database files, 
PDF stored in on your computer, on Dropbox, on Box. Uh, these are things, uh, assuming it's allowed by company policy, of course, that you could save in something like a second brain. Maybe you have screenshots, maybe you have photos, web pages, things, little bits of creative inspiration or things that resonate with you or things you might find useful or interesting that you could bring and gather into a second brain. And I want to talk now a little bit about specifically what kind of software program you might want to use. If you think about the different tools that you already use in your day-to-day -day work, each one is suited for a particular purpose. So maybe you use Microsoft Word to, to write down notes to yourself. And you can do that, but it's not ideally suited for quick notes. Really what Microsoft Word is, is designed for is formatting and printing. It's designed to create printable documents that can be transferred person to person and retain their formatting. But this is not the ideal scenario for personal knowledge management. Here's, here's my test. If you're walking down the street, or you're at dinner, or you're in a cafe, or on the train, and an idea occurs to you. Something could be far out, could be speculative, could be random, but it pops up in your brain. Are you really going to take out your phone and within 20 or 30 seconds, capture that little bit of knowledge, save it, and put your phone back? I don't think that's very likely to happen with Microsoft Word. I think it's unlikely you're going to Oh, find the file, open it up, scroll down 10 pages to find the exact right place, and then write it there. It's just too heavy duty and formal and bureaucratic for something that is so lightweight and in the moment. You could also use social media. And this is actually great because you can actually get your ideas out there and then have people engage with you and give you feedback, which is an awesome way to refine your thinking. But social media is not great for the long term. Right? It optimizes for the, the, the current moment, for the now, and then before you know it, it's off in the past and kind of difficult to find. You could also use cloud storage, such as Dropbox, and this gives you certain benefits like sharing and access and multiple devices. But again, it's unlikely you're going to fire up your cloud storage app, find the exact right file where that little string of text goes, scroll down to that place and add it. And you can also use collaborative apps like Google Docs. And this is great, again, because you can collaborate with others. But still, even then, it's too heavy duty to open up this multi-page document. After a lot of experience and testing, the only category of apps that I can really recommend is notes apps, digital notes apps, such as Evernote. These are the only kinds of apps that are optimized for creative output. They're optimized for creative output because notes are inherently kind of quick and dirty. They're messy. They're not something you create for public uh, consumption that needs to be really uh, nice looking. It's something just uh, your free flowing ideas as they happen and then you pull an idea back into your brain and then you put it back out again and you refine it and you edit it and you mix and match it. It's something that's much more organic and personal rather than something that is for publishing. And there's two apps that I recommend, which is Evernote and OneNote. If OneNote is made by Microsoft, it has the same level of uh, support as the rest of the Office 365 suite. So if you'd like to make, uh, remain on Office 365, you can absolutely do that. Just use OneNote, and it has all the functionality that I'm describing today. And what these two apps give you, and actually there's many other digital notes apps that I'm, I can't recommend specifically uh, because I don't know them, but most of the ones that I look at actually have these features which are that they're durable. Every single note you create is automatically backed up on the cloud and on your computer. You don't have to sync it, you don't have to upload it, you don't have to export it. It's kind of in one uh, central interface that is always synced to the cloud. These apps tend to be universal. So you don't have to worry, ah, oh, will I be able to save this kind of file in this app? They can pretty much take anything. Videos, audio, images, text, and even if it can't open the file itself, it will save it as an attachment. These apps are centralized. I can't overstate the value of having all of your knowledge, the distilled most valuable insights and ideas in one central place. So you don't have to go looking for where something is. You don't have to you know, go searching across all these different formats. There is one central interface, one window into finding that piece of knowledge. 
And this one is more subtle, but really critical, which is that, you know, when you're working on a Microsoft Word document, you tend to be focusing on one. It's possible to copy and paste text between them, but it's not very natural. With digital notes apps, it's almost like you have note cards spread out around your desk. You can open multiple of them because each one is quite small. You can see them side by side, create links between them. It's not quite as easy to create links between different Word documents or from a Word document to a PowerPoint presentation. But with when they're all within one app, you can. So basically all the information contained in notes is available and visible with one click instead of you having to double click them and open them. Let me give you a few practical examples of how you might get started with this. So let's say you're reading an ebook. This works on either a Kindle device or the Kindle app on, an, on, a, on a, any other device. If you're reading something and you come across a passage that you think might be worth keeping, you can just put down your finger and select that passage. If you tap the button up on the right, you can see all of the highlights that you've created from this book. And then with just a couple more taps, email those notes directly into your notes app. Both Evernote and OneNote give you a special designated email address that anything you email to that address gets added to your, to your second brain. Imagine if all the highlights, the best parts that you've read in all the books from the past few years were available in one place, searchable and shareable. Or let's say you do more of your reading on the web, online articles. There is a free extension called Liner, which you can download and add to your browser. And once you click the Liner button on the toolbar, it changes your cursor into a highlighter. Anything that you select will automatically be highlighted and saved permanent, permanently to your account. You can then hit share and send it to email, to Google Docs, or to Evernote or OneNote. If I head, I'm going to head over to, One, to Evernote and you can see the note's been synced and I can then highlight the specific sentence in the note that I want to highlight. And then if I wanted, share it. So imagine this, instead of sending a link to a massive article or even a book to someone and asking them to spend a bunch of their time up front to read the thing, you're surfacing the specific paragraph and the specific sentence in that paragraph that you want them to know. They're way more likely to actually consume that bit of knowledge, more likely to value your input that you've given. And if you look at the bottom, you, they can actually click that automatically generated link that says highlighted source to see in context the full article that you highlighted. Or they can click the original link and the original source and see a clean version. Imagine if you were able to send such distilled insights from the things that you read to anyone that you work with or work for. Or let's say you read PDFs. This is a, an app for the iPad called PDF Expert, uh, but it works very similar to other PDF readers. Let's say you find something that you want to keep. You can select a word, drag that little handlebar to the end of the section, hit highlight. You can even hit the comment button and add a short comment about why you're highlighting this. Then hit the share button and share it directly to your notes app. I'm then going to head over to the notes app and you can see within a few seconds, a note was created with the PDF as an attachment. If I open the attachment and scroll to that page, there's my highlights. Now, you may be wondering, how would I even remember that those highlights are there? Well, if you go to the search function and type in something that is found within that PDF,
there we go. It actually searches not just the title of the note, not just the title of the PDF, but it actually searches within the PDF itself. Imagine the kind of research database that you could accumulate over time if you just saved every PDF that you read with the best parts highlighted. So you didn't have to read the whole PDF again. You could go straight to the parts that mattered the most. And that's remembering. Using technology for what it's best at. Remembering precise details over time so you don't have to. A second way of using your second brain is to connect. So what you'll notice as you're creating these notes is that there are patterns and there's associations. And this can happen at different levels. They can be very conceptual. Sometimes maybe you, you study a few different companies and you notice that there's a common trend among all of them. You can actually create links between notes, making that connection explicit. Maybe it reveals something in the environment, something macroeconomically that you might want to call attention to, something that might even influence other investments. Or making connections can be very mundane. Maybe you would just like to tag all of the notes that have to do with meetings, that are notes that you've taken within meetings, so that when you want to review everything you've talked to your team about over the past two weeks, you just do one search and everything uh, that has that tag applied is uh, surfaced. Another example is metadata. Adding metadata, which is little pieces of data that make your notes easier to find, could include a title. You could add an informative title so that you can see at a glance what it's about. You could add bold text or highlights, as I showed before, to kind of really make it obvious what is the main point or the most important uh, point within a, within a note. You could add tags. Make explicit the commonalities and the, the common relationships and the patterns that you observe across your notes. You could add original links. Often you want to know where a piece of information came from. What was the original source? And many kinds of metadata are actually now automatically created. It's things like date, created, and modified, which you can use to sort and filter through your notes. A second example is image views. We often spend a lot of our day dealing with text, text in emails, text in documents. Text is awesome, it's very efficient. But when you're really trying to have a breakthrough, you're trying to have an insight, you're trying to see something that no one else sees, visuals can be really, really powerful. Note-taking apps have often a image view. You can switch very easily between text view and image view. This example comes from Evernote, but you can see that making the images larger and more salient, I can start to see relationships and patterns between the different notes. I could maybe pull two or three of them together to write an email, or combine four or five of them to write a report, and actually draw on more sources besides what I have in my own mind. And a third example is inbound and outbound links. You're probably familiar with outbound links, which is you put a link, a hyperlink in an email or in a document. When someone clicks that link, it takes them to some external resource such as a web page. But imagine if you had little chunks of your knowledge saved in discrete notes. You can, set, you can share with someone, send to someone a specific note. So for example, if a colleague asks me, what is my opinion on say, um, the petroleum industry? Instead of, you know, taking 45 minutes to go search various documents, slowly pull together an email, send them an email that I know they'll probably just look at once and then, you know, we'll get lost in their email archive. Instead of that, I can, I can pull together a small collection of notes and share the, that small collection with them in a way that they can see for themselves. I don't necessarily have to do a bunch of upfront work creating a document when I have these chunks of knowledge that I can snap together almost like Legos, and then share with this person to give them what they need. Think of all the requests for information or the, the common tasks that you perform on a regular basis. Imagine if you had a note that was like a standard template that you could use again and again and almost kind of semi-automate something that you do often, such as running a report or compiling a meeting agenda. Inbound and outbound links basically allow you to make explicit the connections between documents that you already know, but that sometimes you forget about or sometimes get broken. And you know, connections can seem like a kind of random thing to put out there, but 
I was reading recently this summary of the research of uh, this man named Eddie Opera in the Atlantic, where he was telling, he was talking about his research over decades on creative people. How do creative people have novel ideas and novel breakthroughs? And I love that he, his research really demystified a lot of what we think of as this kind of mystical thing called creativity, down to just recognizing relationships, making associations and connections, realizing that this thing is like this thing. These two things that seem to be two things are actually one thing, or this one thing seems to be two things. And I think we can actually improve our creativity, not as a mysterious internal force, but as something that's tangible and practical and real and something that can be shared with others by creating these kind of links between our different chunks of knowledge. And the third thing that you can use your second brain for is to create. And I know that word create, you might think, well, I'm, I'm an analyst or I'm a director or I'm a vice president. What do, what do I have to be creating? We often think of creating as like an artist or a songwriter, but that's really not what I mean. I think there's a really good reason for us all to think of ourselves as creators. This is a study that came out in 2013 that looked at which kinds of jobs would last the longest as automation, computerization, artificial intelligence advance. What are the kinds of jobs that will be most resistant to technological change? that will still be available for humans. And what they found is that it wasn't jobs that required these most powerful intellect or the greatest memory or the most advanced skills. It was jobs that required that, that used the ability to convey not just information, but a particular interpretation of, inf of information. They found that building, maintaining, promoting, advocating for a perspective particular frame, an interpretation of what is happening is what is most valuable and what will be most specific to humans. And here's the thing about inter interpretation. What separates a strong interpretation from an opinion is supporting evidence. It's not just what you think or what you believe, but what you can show, what you can prove. And for that, you need examples illustrations, screenshots, statistics, mind maps, diagrams, book notes, quotes. These are just some examples of the kind of backup data, supporting evidence that you need to be able to actually have your interpretation make a difference. Have it be something compelling, powerful, that can change the conversation, that can possibly determine whether an investment happens or not, or what the terms are, or what the, or what the agreement is. And an interpretation is not something you sit down and you just create. It's not just opening a Word document and writing down my interpretation, my investment philosophy. It's actually something that emerges. It emerges organically over time from a long process of testing and refining and evolving and developing ideas, ideas and arguments. And this process, I really think, is a process of creating knowledge. At every step of the way, in every intermediate stage as you're refining your argument or your theory, you're creating something, you're creating artifacts. So here's some examples of what it looks like to actually create knowledge in, in pursuit of an interpretation. It starts with seeing, seeing things differently. And this is, can be as simple as switching environments, working from a different location, working around different people, working on a different team. Can include getting feedback from users, from frontline employees, from on the ground managers that might help you actually understand what, what a, how a business functions on the ground. Or interviews and surveys, asking people what they think, what they, what they believe, and actually having a place to store that where it'll be accessible in the future. This could include writing. Taking good notes has been shown to greatly improve recall and retention. Hi even highlighting it, the simple act of highlighting or underlining something you're reading, you start to practice the judgment of what matters and what doesn't matter. What is the main point and what is not the main point? Sharing on social media. With Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, we're all sort of these constant media publishers putting out little snippets of things we've discovered or things we like or things we 
or things we want others to like. That's a form of creating knowledge. Drawing is a wonderful way. There's f there's few better ways of under really understanding an idea than trying to represent it visually. This could be sketch notes, visual notes. It could be creating diagrams or drawings, trying to show trends, trying to show to show what the numbers are saying in a more visual way. It could include making slides. Often the process of putting your ideas into a presentation, even if you never present it, can kind of help you work out the logic of what you're trying to say. Creating knowledge can, be, can include performing. You could present at a meetup. Every city has meetups where you can get in front of an audience and speak on something as long as it's related to the topic of the meetup. You could speak in an event or conference. If you really want to accelerate your learning on a topic, put yourself forward as an authority, as someone who knows what they're talking about, and your learning will skyrocket. Even if you don't want to get in front of people, you could record a video. Video consumption is rapidly taking over the internet. We have Instagram stories and Facebook and Snapchat and Periscope and all these new apps every year that allow you to express yourself through video. This could include producing things. Summarize a book that is popular in your field for others who don't have the time to read it. Interpret or critique a common investment philosophy that you think is flawed in some way. Translate something to an, to an alternative medium. Turn a book into an outline, an outline into uh, an audio recording, an audio recording into a transcript. There's so many ways with digital information to quickly convert it into different, con into different formats that are easier to share. And of course, if you really want to test the value of your ideas, selling is maybe the ultimate way. And this includes actual selling, of course. Sometimes you don't have that opportunity in your role, but it could include teaching, selling your ideas, or selling collaborations, selling your boss on devoting more resources to a particular approach, uh, selling your team on contributing their skills and their knowledge to something that you're working on. Every single one of the activities on this slide produces something, some sort of tangible artifact that then you can save back to your second brain, which continues to get recycled and reviewed in a kind of feedback loop. This way of thinking is really well summarized in a quote by the 18th century philosopher, Gian Battista Vico. He said, we only know what we make. And I think this, this attitude is an excellent antidote to the the culture of information hyperconsumption, this idea that you should just consume as much as you can. If it's true that you only know what you make, the only way to know more things is to make more things. And I think we would all benefit by shifting some of our effort from consuming to actually producing more things, not just to create more value for the business, but to provide more satisfaction and fulfillment, the fulfillment of actually seeing something that you gave birth to from your own thinking and your own ideas. Zooming out now to the big picture, <clears throat> I think most people's knowledge is like a dense jungle. The knowledge is there, it exists, and I'm sure it's very valuable, but it's hidden there, it's hidden in a morass of files and folders spread across many different locations, it's impossible to access. And if knowledge is, not, is, is impossible to access, it can't really be used. As you begin this process of creating digital notes, of externalizing and offloading your knowledge from your first brain to your second brain, you start to reveal your personal knowledge landscape. You start to see the boundaries around what you know and what you don't know, which sometimes is even more valuable. You start to see there's a mountain over here, which represents that you know a lot about a certain topic. And over here, there's a small hill, which means you know a little bit. Or there's a valley or a recess, which means you know nothing. Knowing what you know is the kind of self-awareness and sort of uh, meta-awareness that is so valuable in industries such as yours, which are both simultaneously information hyperabundant and also rely on very subtle judgments and subtle interpretations. <laughs> the question often comes up as people engage in this process, what is my first brain for? 
If the second brain is so powerful and we have the technology and everything, what is left for me to do? And this can even be a little threatening and I think has been the source of some resistance to knowledge management or knowledge capture in the past is if the company knows everything that I know, what's left for me? And this is why the focus on personal knowledge management is so important. It's not about extracting anything. It is about giving each person the tools and the mindset and the, and the methods to get maximum value from their own knowledge for the period of time that they are with a company. And what people often find is as even when they begin offloading what they know onto software, onto digital notes, it frees up tremendous bandwidth. It's like a whole new channel opens up in your mind that before was occupied with trying to remember and track to do's and details and different pieces of research. It opens up to be more situationally aware. And situation aware, situational awareness is simply knowing which trends, opportunities, and threats are developing in an environment or in a domain or in a field. And I really think that situational awareness is one of the critical skills for surviving and thriving in the 21st century. It's knowing what a subject is about or useful for instead of knowing every detail of a subject. That matters because once we know what knowledge is worth acquiring, we can acquire that knowledge on demand as needed. The challenge is knowing which knowledge is worth acquiring. Once you do, you can go to where or who has that expertise and can give it to you rather than trying to have all the expertise yourself. Situational awareness is the job that I think humans are, are designed for, that humans are meant to have. The more of the low value jobs that we hand over to computers, the more of our time and, er ener time and energy will be freed up for this kind of higher value strategic thinking. And ultimately, at the end of the day, after the end of the workday, what all this is really about is fulfilling the original promise of technology. The original promise, do you remember what it was? The original promise of labor saving devices was that they were going to free us. They were going to free us from the drudgery and the mindless routine and the low skill, low value jobs that anyone could do so that we could be more productive more effective and spend our precious time and our, our precious skills working on the most difficult, biggest challenges that we can. And if we do that, I think it'll be making an investment, not just a financial investment, but an investment of knowledge. Investing our knowledge in such a way that it starts to produce returns, starts to produce value completely on its own. Apart from our time and our in, like uh, being there in person to monitor and to manage things by investing our knowledge in artifacts that have their own life and their own existence apart from us, we can be free to live the lives we want to live, lives that are more satisfying, that are less stressful, that are more purposeful and more fulfilling. And imagine what you could accomplish as a company if you had a culture that allowed that, where technology was not a necessary evil or something to fix so that you could get things done, but instead was something that actually accelerated people's learning and accelerated their ability to apply what they know to create real, real results. That is the ultimate purpose of personal knowledge management. I wanna thank you for being an excellent audience. <clears throat> As I said before, if this is something that resonates with you, that you would like to find out more about, talk to me after this talk and we'll be happy to tell you more about my intensive online course, which goes much deeper, called Building a Second Brain. Thank you.